Hey, I'm Pastor Mike, and thank you so much for taking time to check out this message. And I hope that it inspires you. I hope it pushes you either towards a relationship with Jesus or further along in your relationship with Jesus. But we would never want this message to replace the reality of what it means to be involved with a local church. Although I'm excited that you're checking this out and I, and I hope it speaks to you, let me encourage you that you need to be involved in a local body. There's something to the fact that you need to be under the authority of the spiritual lead of a pastor and involved in a community that can push you uh, further along. We are meant to be in community. So enjoy this message, but let me encourage you to be seeking an opportunity to be involved with a local church. How about now? Yeah. All right, all right. So I got to tell you, um, you see all this? We didn't decorate for you this morning, by the way. Um, and like this thing with the, the batteries, um, I, it's been one of those mornings where if there's anything that could go wrong, it's gone wrong this morning. Like, like our iTunes account was all jacked up, so we didn't have music before. And anyway, we had all this stuff going on. Guess what I'm teaching on today? Distractions. How you like that? Like, I, I love how God has got it. And this morning, I got, Lizzie sent me this, uh, this uh, picture last night when I was at a Christmas party and kind of like, uh, look at this. What do you want to do about this? And of course, my first reaction was like, are you kidding me? Like, this is where our prayer team comes to pray with people. Blah. So I'm at this Christmas party going, hey, how are you doing? Yeah. And on the inside, I'm like, you know, Christian cussing. You know what I'm talking about? Kind of thing. And, uh, and it was funny because God said to me this morning, um, I gave you an illustration of distractions. Like, like I gave you an illustration of the reality of what is life. And so I kind of glad the battery's jacked up. I'm kind of glad this is happening because I don't know about you, but sometimes I go places and everything's so perfect that I don't relate because my life's not perfect. Anybody else? Right? Anybody else? Everything else you see on everybody else's Instagram is always like, you know, filtered perfect. Right? And the reality is, is that's not our life. So I, I'm excited that God's doing something this morning. I think he's going to do something in your hearts if you'll open up and listen to his word. But let me give you a couple quick announcements real quick before I get into uh, the teaching. Really excited about something that we are going to be doing. Uh, first of February, we'll start small groups back. And uh, one of the things that was an excellent idea that came out of Life Steps, some new members of ours, and that was starting in February at 8.30. Okay, church is at 10.00. At 8.30, we're going to have a seniors, basically like a Sunday school class, right? So there'll be a, the rock will be open for some of our seniors, and Mr. Wally has agreed to teach that class. And so for those of you seniors that you're used to kind of like Sunday school back in the day type of a deal, we're going to have Sunday school for you from 8.30 to 9.30. I thought it was a really great idea. So if, that, if you're interested in that and you want to be a part of that, would you put it on a Connect card? Let us know. Hey, we're, we're thinking about coming to the, the Sunday school class. And we don't have to call it seniors if that bothers you. Uh, we can call it active adults, or we can just call it like north of 50 or whatever you want to call it. Uh, kind of thing. But, but we really do want to give that opportunity for you. So if that's something you're interested in, I think that would be really cool. Christmas Eve at 6.30 right here in the auditorium. Invite some people to come with you. And then um, in January, I want, really want, I have an anticipation for this season, for this 2020 that I, I can't explain it all to you, but I'll say it to you in this way. And um, it's funny because those of you who have a certain background will take it a certain way, and those of you who have a different background will take it in a different way. But here's the prayer that the Holy Spirit literally had come out of my mouth. Because when, I don't know if you've ever done this, but I said words and thought, holy, wow, what was that? Kind of a thing. And it was in prayer on Tuesday. And, uh, and, and here's the prayer. I asked God for 2020 for us to experience the Holy Spirit in a, in a fresh way. Now stop. You Pentecostals don't start yelling. Okay, listen to me right? Here's, here's what I mean by that. That we would put away traditions and backgrounds and, and, and the realities of what we think is normal 
and that we would learn to what it really means to walk in the Spirit in 2020. That's my expectation and, and, and my anticipation for what that looks like. Now listen to me again. Throw your background out. I'm not saying nobody's going to be running the aisle. I'm not, I'm not saying we're going to be having prophetic words. Or I'm, not, I'm not saying all that. Throw all that out. Here's what I'm asking. That we would see the Holy Spirit in a fresh way. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Not just in a way that we've always done it. Not just in a normal pattern. But in whatever he would have for us. Does that make sense? And so it is that much more important in my mind for us to do 21 days of prayer coming in January. 21 days of prayer and fasting that we're going to take the first part of this year and sort of tithe it to God and, and, and give that time back. And I'm going to do the 5 a.m. videos for those that want to get up early and do the, that, that time in the morning. Uh, but I have such an anticipation of what I think God wants for us to do and participate in. Like, I kind of feel like we've been playing in the kiddie pool. You understand what I mean? Like, like we've been playing in the kiddie pool and, and I just feel like 2020, the Holy Spirit wants to do something that, that we don't understand. Now, for those of you who have a different background and you go, whoa, 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 where are you taking us and where does that mean we're going? Listen to me. The scripture tells us to walk with the Spirit. I'm not taking us anywhere. We're throwing all tradition. We're throwing all things out. I don't want to hear about what, how you did it over here. I don't care how this group does it or that church does it. What we're looking for is a real profound and fresh interaction with the Holy Spirit. Do you hear what I'm saying? Amen. That we might walk in whatever that means and whatever he tells us to do. So we're going to go on that journey. So I want to challenge you to get ready for 21 days of prayer and fasting. Um, for some of you, physically, you need to get ready. You need to maybe talk to your daughter, uh, your daughter, your doctor about, about fasting and, uh, and about that scenario so that you can make sure health-wise that you can do what it is that you need to do. And I just, I'm just, I'm just telling you, the scriptures, uh, I, I read the scripture the other day. It said, God looked far and wide for someone he could use. And he found no one. And man, something inside of me broke. Like, like to think that God would look far and wide in Leesburg and there's churches on just about every corner. And the response might be that he found no one. Why? Because we already have our own ideas of the way God works. And we have our own ideas of the way the Holy Spirit works. And we have our own limitations of what we will and won't do. And, all, and so all I'm asking for Church of the Lakes is for us to consider 2020 sort of just a year of surrender. A year of palms up. God, what does this look like? And what does this look like for us to really walk in the Spirit? Not just do old church traditions. Not just to do, does that make sense? Are you guys following with me? So I just, I just want you to begin to pray and ask God, what are you going to do for, for, for 21 days of prayer and fasting? Um, what, what kind of fasting are you going to do? And maybe get on, Google it, right? Google has all the answers to life, right? Go kidding. Google it and, and find out about fasting because there's different ways to do fasting. But, uh, but that kind of leads into what I want to talk about today because I, I want to talk about distractions. So we started a series last week talking about traveling light, right? Tomorrow, Jen and I leave um, on our little anniversary getaway. We're really excited about that. So we're leaving the house 5 a.m. tomorrow morning, driving down to get on a boat, and we're going on a cruise, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. I felt the Holy Spirit just saying that, right? And, um, but, uh, but it was funny because packing, right? Like I was packing yesterday, and I'm thinking like, do I need this? Do I need that? I need this. And, and I got this big honk, and, and I'm like, this is crazy. Like I'm going, we're going for six days. It's six days. But it's amazing the amount of things that we feel like we need for six days. Right? And that's kind of what this series is about because our life is that way. Like we just, we feel like we need all this stuff. And so we've collected all this stuff. I talked about my garage. Anybody else got a garage full of stuff? Right? Anybody need a, you know, like a Craigslist account for your garage? You know what I mean? Like, like, why? Why do I have that bike hanging up there? Why do, why do we have this kayak? There's like, we have a kayak. You, you want to know the last time I was in a kayak? I think I was like 14. I mean, like, I don't remember the last time we used that kayak. Why? And, and there's this thing inside of us where we collect, but it's not just physical things that we collect. It's regret. It's grudges. It's hurt. 
It's, it's all these different things that we've collected. And then we wonder why our marriage is doing what our marriage is doing right now. Right? And, and, and we wonder why we're struggling so much with our kids right now. And I think it's because we're not traveling light. Because we've forgotten that this place is not our home. Like this, can I say, this is not the point. Right? Th this is not the point. Right? Nothing, nothing that you can see right now. Look around. See that we got trees and we got a big old video screen and cool lights and sound systems and I got a confidence monitor, it's called, right? To keep you confident. I don't know what that means. But anyway, um, but, but, but hear me, listen to me. There's only one thing that you can see right now that lasts forever. One, the people sitting around you. That's it. All the rest of it is distraction. All the rest of it causes us, and this is why the Bible says, to keep your eyes set, focused on the prize. What is the prize? The prize is heaven. The prize is eternity. As opposed to my eyes being focused here in this place, on this world, on these things, on all of this stuff. The word distraction is actually derived from a Latin word in the... In the, in the Yes, no, yes, there we go. All right, listen, 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 don't be distracted. A pulling apart, separating, a drawing of the mind in different directions. Let me ask you a question, anybody's mind being drawn in different directions right now? Nothing like the holiday season to draw your mind into all different kinds of directions, right? I mean like, for us to get ready to try to go on this trip, has been insanity in some ways, right? Like last week I wrote three sermons to try to get ahead because we got Christmas Eve, we got, right? And all these things, and listen to me. We have an enemy and, and, and we call him the devil, right? We have an enemy. Like for those of you who don't know that, there's an enemy of your soul. For, the, for those of you who have forgotten, you're at war. And we have so many creature comforts around us in the United States, we forget that we're at war because we're so comfortable, right? It's only when something breaks, it's only when something messes up where we're reminded of the reality of the brokenness of this world. Which is why I think God just orchestrated this morning for there to be drums and mics not working, you know, and Tara was struggling a bit, little bit with songs. I, I mean, it, it's because that's the reality of what's going on around us, is this, is this struggle and the enemy is loving the idea of just distracting you. Listen to me, hear this. See, the, the devil does not have to destroy you. All he has to do is distract you enough and you'll destroy yourself. I mean, I have this picture. I think we have this picture of the devil and he's like all active and all of that. I don't think so. I really have this picture of the devil, especially when he deals with anybody in the United States. I have a picture of him kicked back in a lazy boy. Go and watch this. Let me just throw a little extra money at him. Let me just throw this little challenge at him and watch them destroy themselves. Because we'll go in so many different directions, pulled off, distracted, so many different ways. Listen to this, 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. Be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith. See, I think there are battlefronts, and if you don't know what the battle is, you don't know how to battle it. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, like, if you don't know what the problem is, you don't know how to deal with it. Right? How many of you have ever had your car break down, but you, you, don't, you don't know what's wrong? 
right? You're looking at it like, I'm not a mechanical guy. I'm going to call a mechanic. That's just who I am. Um, and they'll call me when they need counseling or pastoral care. But the reality is, is I'm not a mechanical guy. So the girl's car will break down. Ayana's car breaks down and starts making this crazy beeping noise out of the dash. I had no clue what it is, right? Zero clue. We're in the gas station down here at Circle K. And I'm just kind of looking at it like, I, I don't know. I'm about to call Miguel or one of the guys that's a mechanic or whatever. And God was gracious because I don't know what I did. I turned something, pulled something, the thing went off. And they went, Dad, you fixed it. And I said, of course I did, right? <laughs> but, but how many of you have been in that place? Thank you. But how many of you have been in that place where you really, you just don't know? And here's what I want to do today. What I want to do today is I want to kind of pull back the curtain a little bit on the concept of distractions that we might have in our lives that I think that the enemy might be using, especially during this season, right, to get us off track. Because again, he doesn't have to destroy us with him. Uh, he just has to give us enough rope. We'll hang ourselves, right? So, so what does that battle look like? Well, I picked a, a, a story that uh, is kind of an interesting story. It's the story of Elijah. It's in 1 Kings chapter 17. I want to read through this story a little bit with you this morning. 1 Kings 17 verse 1, it says, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, okay, a bunch of big crazy words. Uh, don't worry about the actual place, but I want you to understand Elijah was a, a prophet. It's a pretty big deal in the Old Testament uh, for those that don't know that. But this is the first time that Elijah shows up on the scene in the Bible. So this is the first kind of introduction. Who is this guy coming out? He's a prophet, but it's kind of the first big deal. And Ahab is King Ahab. Now this is verse, this is chapter 17. If you read chapter 16, it says that Ahab was one of the worst kings ever in God's sight. Like this is just a terrible dude, right? Elijah comes to Ahab and he says this, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except by my word. This is the first time Elijah shows up. And I can't help but think, if I'm Ahab, I'll be like, who are you? Like, what are you? Yeah, you're going to stop it from raining. Okay, big dog. Right? But, the, but, he, but he comes and he's bold in this. Now, skip down to verse 7 and it says this. Sometime later. Okay, I want you to, I want you to hear something. This is sometime later. How long did it, did it last? Well, the drought of no rain lasted three and a half years. So we really don't know how long this is, but it's long enough that sometime later, the brook dried up. So the water flow and what they had for water and all was drying up. I mean, it had been long enough in that scenario because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath. Stop. Zarephath is about a week's journey. Okay, so you're talking at least a week for him to walk and get to that place. In the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed, if you are person that likes to do word study, you might want to circle that word or underline that word directed. I have directed a widow. God himself has directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked her, would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I can have a drink? Think through that question. What did we just read about the brook? The brook is dried up. Right? He comes to a widow. Now, why is that significant? The reason that is so significant is because in that day, ladies didn't work. In this culture, the men work and took care of the ladies. So if you're a widow, you were hurting. Like you were hurting from the beginning already because you didn't have anything. But now there's a famine and there's no water in the brook. And the first thing the man of God says to her is, hey, get me a cup of water. How many of you have ever been asked to do something that you thought you didn't have in you to give? Like you got into a situation in a moment when you were just like, I can't handle, I can't do this. I can't, I can't, hand, I can't take this anymore. Maybe you've said that about work. Maybe you've said that about your marriage. Maybe you've said that about kids. But most of us have found ourselves in that place where we go, I can't do what I feel like I'm being asked to do. And I can only imagine the widow going, I don't, I don't, I don't have any water. But listen to this. Would you bring me a little cup of, of um, water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it. So uh, apparently she like, you know, is reluctant, but okay. And she starts to walk away. I love it because Elijah's going to push the envelope. Check this out. And 
bring me please a piece of bread. I don't know, it must have been a really kind and nice widow. Because if the, the widow had had Mike's personality, I think at that point I'd have turned around and been like, are you on drugs? Do you know who I am? I'm a widow. I have nothing. I don't have anything. I don't have anything to give you. Why are you asking me? Why are you pushing me in this way? And isn't it funny how we have this tendency to react in that way, whether it be angry, whether it be frustrated. I mean, this widow is in a bad, bad place. Deep inside of us, each one of us, there's a desire to matter, to count, to leave a mark on this world. But life is hard and it seems so easy to be distracted. That widow has the same desire that you and I have. To, to mean something, to matter. Why am I here to be significant? She has that same God-given reality. And yet she's in a place where most likely the words that she's saying to herself are, I am insignificant. I have nothing to offer. And most of us have found ourselves in that place where we go, all this stuff that's going on, and, and I'll say it this way, all these distractions of this earth have got me to a place where all I can focus on is the problem and nothing of what God is trying to purpose in my life. How many of you have ever lost your keys but had them in your hand? How many of you have looked everywhere for your glasses? Oh, they're on your head. And, and that is such a reality of our lives, if we're honest, on a day-to-day -day basis. What God wants to do is sitting right there on top of our head, but we're looking everywhere else in the distractions of this life, in the distractions of this world, right? Life is coming at us at such a pace these days that it's easy to get away from what is really important. It's especially easy to get distracted from the purposes of God. Sometimes the struggle of this life are so big that we easily forget that God is working on something. Some of you are in that place right now of waiting for an answer. And it's so easy in that moment. And what I mean is, you don't see a light at the end of the tunnel on that doctor's report. You don't see a light on the end of the tunnel in your marriage. You don't see a light on the end of the tunnel with that thing with your kids or that thing with your business or those struggles and we find ourselves in that place and it is so easy for us to line up all the struggles and the problems of this world and just sit there and talk about them. And just sit there and talk about them. And just sit there and talk about them. And the distraction is from the reality that if God is who he says he is, He's still sitting on the throne. If God is who he says he is, he is working on something. Does anybody remember when satellites were as big as a beetle bug? You know what I'm talking about? Come on, old folks, right? Right? Young people, listen to me. We used to have these satellites. And they were ginormous. And people would put them on the side of their house. Right? And try to get kind of reception. I heard the story one day of this guy that spent all day long trying to get his satellite turned just right. And he could not, he could get nothing. He could get no reception, nothing, no TV channels. It's not, not 800 channels like today. Back then it was like 50, right? You got like 50 channels. And that was amazing. That was like ridiculous, way too many channels. But anyway, so he calls a friend of his who's excellent with satellites, who has some expertise. And he comes and literally his friend turns the satellite one quarter of an inch. Boom, 50 channels popped up. And the guy says, well, wait, wait, well, dude, I have been trying to turn this thing all day long. What's the deal? And he said, well, listen to me. Down here, that's a quarter of an inch, but up there, it's 1,500 miles. And the reality for us in our lives, where we're focused right here, trying to figure things out and we need somebody to help us to understand that we're not off by one quarter of an inch, we're off by 1500 degrees because of where it is that God is trying to take us. I promise you something that you're not gonna like me saying. I promise you that God has probably got a different idea than the one you've got in your mind right now. He's probably got a different way of solving it. He's probably got a different way of that happening. 
And, and, and we are just a quarter inch turn when it ends up being 1,500 miles off from where it is that he is taking us and what it is he's trying to do. So the widow and the son are starving um, and, and to death and the prophet of God asks her to make him a cake. Here's her response in verse 12. As surely as the Lord of God lives, she replies, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour and a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. And I picture her saying it just like that. Right? With a little extra emphasis. Jug. Because that's what we do. That, that, that's what we do when we're, we're mad and, and we're upset about something. Right? When, when, when the car breaks down. And so, I can't believe this. And I have this picture of her in this struggle. But what I want you to notice is that her first thing to talk about is the bread. This is the first battlefront that we have in distractions. Number one is this. Number one is the battle of appetites. The battle of appetites. See, sometimes you just feel like you need something. Anybody ever felt that? And depending on what it is you feel like you need, it is something to distract me from the pain or the struggle or whatever it is that I'm in. Things, things that we're hungry for more than we are God. First Peter 2 and 16 calls it the lust of the eyes, right? It's the desire to possess what we see or to have things which we see as visually appealing. Okay, I had the opportunity the other day to ride for the very first time in a Tesla. Like down the interstate to push the button and it drove itself. Like the coolest, man, it was so cool and all this sort of stuff. And it was so funny. I love my truck. And some of you guys have heard the God story about how I got my truck and I get paid cash for it and it's paid for and I got no payments. All of a sudden, I'm sitting there in that seat going, I wonder how we could get a Tesla. <laughs> Come on, do you not do the same thing? And it's, it's amazing how quickly the enemy will, will, will dangle the carrot. Why will we'll, 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 like entice us with, with our appetites, these things that we feel like we, we, we need or we, we have to have. And your appetites can be physical. Your appetites can be emotional. Right? The, the battlefield of the, 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 uh, the appetites. Verse goes on. And in that same verse, she says this. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son. And I want you to stop in that because what she's telling us is she's telling something about her priorities, right? The next battlefront when it comes to distractions for us to is, is not just appetites, but number two is the battle of affections. The things that we choose to love, right? The things that we choose to love to love. So how many, do we have any cat lovers here? Yeah, we're praying for y'all to get saved, right? I'm kidding. But it's amazing because like, I don't, I don't, like we have a cat. Cat's name is Kit Kat. Yeah, it was sitting on the couch next to me, but I'm kind of like, eh, okay, good. Go away. Um, like, it's just not, listen, that's just not affection of mine. But my dog, Yeti, I love that stinking dog. Like I hug that dog every day. Like I'm a little kid with that dumb little, you know. But, but these things that we choose to have affections for in this, she shows her affection for her son. Let me go ahead and say this, parents. A lot of us are parenting in unhealthy ways because we have dysfunctional affections with our kids. Our goal is for them to like us more than it is to create something in them. Sorry, I had to step on the toes there for a second. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Some of us are in, unhealthy in the way that we're dealing with our spouses because it's more about what we need from them than what we give to the relationship. So, so, so we get unhealthy in our affections. We get dysfunctional is the word. And this is called lust of the flesh. And it's described by what is meant to live life dominated by the senses. Right? Everything is, is about is, is my feelings. I need my feelings fixed. I, I, I need all these kind of things. So kids are, you know, a place where we can put so much affection towards them that we choose our affection over their plan, the plan that God has for their life. Affections are what we choose to love. What do you love more than God's plan? God tasted, he, he tested Abraham. Do you remember the story? And he did it with his son. He told Abraham to sacri literally sacrifice his son. 
And I've thought through that a few times. Like, like what if God said to me, sacrifice Chrisinda? Right? I mean, she's sitting here on the front row looking at me with a funny face now. Like, but I'm, I'm, I'm being serious because like this really happened. This, like he literally built an altar, put the dude up there. And so I can only imagine like, what would it be like to put Chris into there and have a knife in my hand? And this is the drastic reality that God wants to show us from the standpoint of, do you love me most? Do you love me more? Like, what is it that you have affection for that you would not give up, that is holding you back from what it is that God wants you to do. The end of the verse says this. She says that I'm gathering sticks to take home for my meal for myself and my son, that we may eat and die. She's a little frustrated. Would you agree? You ever been that way? I'm just... Whatever, I'm just going to go eat this meal. Like, you probably have never said that, but you felt those things. I'm just going to go to buffalo wild wings and eat till I'm fat and then die. And that's what she says. And in that moment, listen to me, number three is the battle of agendas. Because she has a plan. She has a plan for herself, right? She has a plan of what the way she thinks it's going to go. Let me ask you, you got a plan? You got a plan? Right? You know exactly how you, right? You got to work to anybody a planner? I'm a planner. Like, I want, I want to know what's going on. I'm trying to figure it out, right? Well, if you're a good enough planner, you become a really good manipulator. Right? Because you can get other people to do because you're trying to get to a certain place. And we, and we can call it cool things. Like, I'm a really good negotiator. <laughs> When, when what it really comes down to is the ability to manipulate people to get to the agenda that I want, that I have for myself, that I have planned out. And we got to be really, really careful. What have you planned to do? What have you mapped out as the course for your life? Is that what God has planned for you? Is that the way that he has? And the Bible in First John calls it this, calls it the pride of life. What we want to do. And so let me ask you, have you asked God what his agenda is? Have you asked God, what is, his, what is God's agenda for your marriage? What is God's agenda for your kids? What is God's agenda for your business? What is your God's agenda? Why does God have you in Leesburg or Fruitland Park or Sumter County, Eustace, the villages, why, why is it that God has placed you? Because God is sovereign and he's got a plan. And remember, the whole time he's placed you in this place and given the plan, he's, he's got a plan that he's thought of from a long time ago. If you read, if, if Psalm 139 is true, he laid out the days for me before I was ever formed in my mother's womb. Like, so what does today, what was God's version of today? What, what is, what, before, before you were born, Be, before he, because he came up with a plan, he came up with an idea, and then he fashioned you to fulfill that. What, what is God's idea for tomorrow, for Monday, for you? What does that look like? Like, what, what does it look like for, for his agenda? Well, let's look at what God's agenda was for the widow. Picking up in verse 13, Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. <laughs> When somebody's upset and afraid, that never works, right? That's like when somebody's all mad and jacked up. You go, oh, just calm down. Calm down. I will knock you out, right? Like that never works. So I, I just, I, I, that just makes me laugh. Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me. I love this. I love this story. Elijah's like, yep. I see you, and I see her almost like stamping her feet, you know, when she's saying, I'm going home, I'm eating, I'm going to die. Elijah goes, that's good. Okay, go make some bread. Like that, that that's, that's his response. Okay, go make, as a matter of fact, go make me some bread. I heard your little plan. Go make me some bread, right? Then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Listen. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. 
What was the plan for the widow? The plan was God's got it all covered. He, he's going to make the, the jar never empty, right? He, he's going to, he, he's, listen to me, I have the supply for all that you need, which I think I've read that somewhere else in the scripture, right? That he will supply and provide all of our need, not our wants, right? I don't think the Tesla is in that for me. You, you, you're right now we get into prosperity gospel. No, 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 no. But he will supply all your needs and his idea, if you will line up and we will line up with him, if we'll align our lives. My truck, I got to take my truck as soon as I get back. I started feeling a little, you ever get that in the steering wheel? You know what I'm talking about? A little wobble? Because the tire's getting a little bit off. You got to go get the tires aligned. What happens if you don't go get the tires aligned? You might have a blowout. It's going to get bad. You may damage some other things. And it's so true in our lives. That's what the devil wants to do. So bring some little distractions. Sprinkle them in your life where there's just a little bit of a wobble. So that you become unaligned with what it is that God wants for you. Right? So that, so that you become destroyed in what it is. So let's counter. Let's counter. If this is kind of his battle plan of distractions, how do we counter those distractions? 2 Corinthians 10 and uh, 3 through 4. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. How does the world wage war? Well, these days it's on Twitter. Right? And it's ugly. Like that's, that's how the world wages war. It's, 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 a, it's a war of words. It's a war of one up. It's a war, I'm going to win. Like we're going to argue people. I don't, apparently we didn't learn anything from the Jerry Springer show. Has anybody ever seen a Jerry Springer show where at the end they go, oh, you were right, and hug, and everyone walks off all happy? That never happens, right? The world argues and is bitter and is ugly and all this. Listen, but we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. What's a stronghold? A stronghold is a, a thought. A stronghold is a way of thinking and, and a deception that, that the enemy brings to distract us from what is true and what is real, right? So number one, if we're going to deal with our appetites, number one, we're going to have to starve your appetites. You're going to have to starve your appetites. Colossians 3 and 5. So kill, this is from the amplified version. Okay, so kill, deaden, deprive of power the evil desires lurking in your members. Listen to me, this is the part of Christianity that we usually don't like to talk about. Because we like talking about God doing transformation. We like to talk about the blessings. We like talking about, well, if I go and serve this person, that I get a check in the mail and those type of things. But what this is talking about is you and I doing the work. We've got work to do. And here's the work that we have to do. We need to be man enough and woman enough to recognize what are the unhealthy appetites that are inside of me, and I've got a part to play to starve them. I've got a part to play to put them down. That's why we're doing 21 days of prayer and fasting, right? The whole, the whole idea of that is to fast, to get away from things that, that tie us to this world so that we can try and connect with God. We don't just give up and do the whole thing just to kind of, oh, because I'm so good and beat my breast and I'm, you know, this whole penance thing and down. No, 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 no. We are trying to get away from those things that connect us to the world that we might connect to God and say, God, I need to hear your voice again. I've gotten so distracted with, with the cares and the concerns and, and, and my own evil appetites. 1 Corinthians 7, 35. I'm saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few, what? Distractions as possible. What is the most common distraction today? It's the Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Mobile Phone. Right? Right? Do you know how much time the average American spends on social media? Not all the rest, just social media. Two hours a day. You know what that equates to? Seven years of your life. Seven years, right? For, for what? 
And I just, I just wonder for some of us if we need to consider how much of a distraction is this in my life? How much is this that the devil loves for me to sit there? Because you know the next thing that we battle as soon as we get on social media, it's comparison. Which is another distraction of the enemy. I'm not good enough. I don't have what they have. I don't, I mean, come, let, let's be honest. There's, there's a few of us holy people, and, and I think there's very few of us, but there's a few of us holy people. We see stuff that other people do. And we go, that is so great. No, that's what we post. On the inside, we go, well, how come I didn't get to her? Well, I never, had, like, and we do this, why? Because the enemy is loving to deal with. And so what is it? What is the, what is the, 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 the things that you need to consider starving? Like, that's the idea of fasting. What are the things? Maybe it's the TV. Maybe you need to stop turning on the TV so much. I mean, maybe, maybe it's, you know, it started, out as, it started out as a glass of wine here and there, and now it's every day. I, I mean, what is it? What are the appetites? What are the things that you can be honest with yourself enough to say, I crave them, instead of craving relationship with God? I crave this instead of saying, I crave the presence of God. And for some of us, that's hard. Listen, I, I'm, not, I'm not pretending like I don't have the same battles. Because there are certain things in my life, like I'm a food person. Anybody else a food person? Come on, man. Right? If I'm happy, let's eat. If I'm mad, let's eat. Right? If I feel ashamed, let's eat. I mean, I, I, I'm, a, I'm an emotional eater. I don't know if anybody else is like that, but I do. Like, I, I love to eat, which is why it's so awesome going on a cruise this week, y'all. When I come back, I'm going to be like 474 pounds. You watch. But, but seriously, what is it that we go after the appetites, the things, whether it be shopping or, or the new shiny thing? Or, or the upgrade, or the, right? All these things that we're chasing, those are appetites. And listen to me, you gotta be bold enough through the power of the Holy Spirit and with the help of somebody else, you can't do this by yourself. I know you don't like hearing this, but you got blind spots, right? Here's a blind spot I had. It's a couple years ago that we were getting towards Christmas time and my wife, uh, we, we were talking about setting up the Christmas tree and we always do it uh, the, the day after Thanksgiving and we set up and all this sort of stuff. And I said something about setting up the Christmas tree and I'm just gonna let the girls do this and this and this. She said, oh, you're just gonna let them do it? I said, yeah. She goes, well, you're just gonna get mad. And I went, no, I, I'm not just gonna get mad. She's like, you get mad every year. And I got furious. I didn't say anything, but I was sitting there on the couch going, I don't get mad every year. What is she talking about? I wasn't mad last year before. But listen to the more I started thinking about it, the reality was, yeah, I would get aggravated because I wanted this or that or, right? And it was a blind spot. Listen to me, you may not be able to see all of the appetites that are unhealthy in you. This is why we do small groups. This is why we say relationships are so important. We need each other. Listen to me. Let your spouse help you. It hurts, but let them help you. Right? If you don't know what your weaknesses are, everybody else around you does. And so let me challenge you to consider as we're closing out this year and in this crazy season, what are the appetites that are unhealthy? What are the things that you need to consider starving. Number one, to starve your appetites. Number two, we talked about affections. You have to set your affections. You have to choose what you love. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. What is the word? Set your heart on things above. That is not an accident that it says, set your heart on things above. In other words, it's not just going to happen naturally. Right? Listen, you're not going to pray the prayer of salvation. Oh, God, save me. I'm a sinner. Thank you, Jesus. And then wake up tomorrow desiring the things of God. You're not. You're going to wake up tomorrow desiring the party that you did the days before. You're going to wake up having the same desires. That sinful nature is still in us. It is on us through the power of the Holy Spirit with help from other people to set our hearts on what I choose to love. What I choose to make important. 
Pastor Ron said it to me this way. Because I do a, a, a lot of stuff in the community. And one of my personal struggles, one of my personal idols, is like the significance thing. Like that was always, a, you know, the reason I wanted to be a doctor, my degree is in biochemistry, and the whole reason I wanted to be a doctor is I just wanted to hear Dr. Matheny to the OR, Dr. Matheny to the OR. Right? That's what, that, 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 was, that was what that was all about. And so, so I will have a tendency to say yes, 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 yes. And not a lot of no's. Because I feel like I need to do this and do this and do this and do this. And Pastor Ron said it to me this way. The problem is, is all the things that you're saying yes to are good. Right? Like the things that people are asking me to do in the community. It's not like somebody's saying, hey, let's start a prostitution ring, Pastor Mike. Right? That's not like it's, it's can we go serve these people or can we do this or can we do that? And they're good, but listen to me, but are they best? And for some of us, We need to stop and recognize the fact that we're choosing a lot of good things, but it's not God's best. It's not what God has. Actually, the devil can use good things to be a distraction to keep us from what is God's best, right? You have to choose. You have to make your choice. Choose what you love. Proverbs 4 and 23. Keep your heart with all vigilance. I love the word vigilance. What's a vigilante? Somebody who just is like they're hardcore right? That's, that's the way you have to be with your heart. Your heart is terrible if you don't work on it. Your, your heart is, is a broken heart. It's sinful. It's depraved unless we work on it, unless we cooperate with God and say, God, I got to work on this thing. I got to look inside. I've got to decide. What is it? Yeah, Mike, you get mad all the time on the Christmas thing. What is that? What is the deal? God, help me with this. God, help me to be honest with with myself on this particular scenario. Right? Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the spring of life. Put away from you crooked speech. uh, Put away from you crooked speech and put away devious talk far from you. Let me just put in gossip in there. How about that one? Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. We do, we do, uh, sometimes at the gym, Al will have me do um, one-armed curls. So I'll go over and get a dumbbell, right? And I have to go one-legged and do curls, right? Which is hard to do. It's especially hard to do when you're just looking around, Right? Like I'm really struggling to stay straight. But what's amazing is if you'll pick a spot on the floor, or like I'm looking at the E on the here, all of a sudden it's amazing how steady you get. And the reality, that's what this verse is saying. This verse is saying you have to set your eyes. You have to, and not divert from the right or the left. Yes, the temptation's there. Yes, it, 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 these things of this world that seem so good, but it's on us. It's on us to cooperate with God. Our relationship with God is the focal point. Any relationship other than that one has to be second. Let me say it to you this way. God will not take second place in your life. He will be first place or he will not participate. And so that's the answer to why we get to those places where we go, God, where are you? And the answer is, I've been here the whole time. You have chosen other relationships instead of the relationship with me. Ann Graham, Billy Graham's daughter, she was interviewed right after Katrina. It was was an amazing interview because the the very secular um, anchor said to her, why would, if God is so loving, why would God let this hurricane happen? And Ann Graham, just without even a thought, she said, well, God, this, this really saddened God. This, as a matter of fact, it broke God's heart. But if you spend enough time as a nation kicking God out of your schools and asking God to leave your government and asking God to leave all the places and having separation of church and state, well, guess what? He's a gentleman. So he'll back up and let whatever come, come. And that is so true in you and, our, you and my, in our life. 
is that, that he won't be second place. He's, he's only going to be a first. Proverbs 4 and 26, don't allow yourself to be sidetracked for even a moment or take the detour that leads to darkness. Another way of saying it is, because we're talking relationships or affections, who we choose to love, you cannot live the right life when you have the wrong friends. You can't. You cannot live out of your purpose when you have the wrong boyfriend or girlfriend. You cannot live the right life when you have dysfunctional relationships as a distraction to God's purpose. Now, what is a dysfunctional relationship? Because, boy, that's a hard one to define. Here's the way I would define it. It's out of alignment with God. That's all that means. All that means is this is not God's way of doing this. So the reason my family gets dysfunctional is simply because we're out of alignment with God. The reason that my home gets dysfunctional, my marriage gets dysfunctional, is because we're out of alignment with God. There's rebellion, there's pride, there's struggle, there's all these things. Set your affections. God, I want your way. I want, it, I, I want my family to run your way. What does that look like? I've got to get in your word and seek that out. I've got to be vigilant to change my heart and battle the darkness that is inside of me. Set your affections. Choose your relationship with God over everything else. Number one is starve your appetite. Number two is set your affections. I'm going to close with this. Number three is submit your agenda. And I'm going to have the band come on up. They're going to play for us in just a second. You guys can come on up and join me on the stage. Number three is submit your agenda. Proverbs 19 and 21. Many are the plans of a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. It's the Lord's purpose that prevails. I don't know what you have planned for the next week or two as the holidays come. I do know this. I do know the devil has all kinds of plans for you. I know that. Because it says he's the enemy of our soul. Well, any good enemy is going to have studied us. So you know what that means? That means the devil knows what your appetites are. He knows what your affections are. He knows the agendas that you've come up with. And so what is he going to do now? Oh, well, let me help feed those things. Right? All I got to do is give them a little bit because they'll go do it themselves. And so what I'm asking you to do this holiday season when it's crazy and commercialized and gifts and all this sort of stuff, all I'm asking you to do is this. Listen, listen. Just submit. I'm tired of doing it with my own power. Any, anybody else? Anybody else get to the place where you finally realize, like, I'm trying to do all this. I'm trying to make it happen. I, I, I've got ideas and I've got, and, and what I'm saying to you is this, is we need to be vigilant with what it is that God's called us to do. Does that, does that make sense to anybody? Does anybody understand what I'm saying to you? And so I, I want to ask you to take a second. Would you, would you close your eyes for just a second? And instead of just hearing these words today, I want you to interact with these words today. Here's what I mean. I want you to take the next couple of minutes and ask God, where are my unhealthy appetites? What, what, are, the, what are the appetites? What are the things that I, that I want? Unfortunately, sometimes maybe more than I even want you. What are the things that I think that are going to make me happy? Where, where are my unhealthy affections? Where I'm, I'm dysfunctional in, in relationship with the things I choose. And God, in this moment, I choose to submit all my agendas, all my ideas, all my thoughts of what life should or shouldn't be. I lay it all down at the feet of your throne. Holy Spirit, speak to us today. Guide us to an understanding of our hearts. That we might that we might get very real for a moment with, with ourselves and with you. God, we want health. We choose health. We choose better. We choose you. 
So as you speak to us, these things, as you speak to us, these, these appetites, these affections, these agendas that are not yours, I pray and now that you give us courage to actually do something about it. Give us courage to find somebody to talk to, to share, to find somebody to help us, to take next steps, to change appetites and affections and agendas, that we might find your will for our lives. Here's what I'd like to do to end out today. Ask Tara if she would sing where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, which we sang today. And I'm hoping now maybe you'll sing that in a different way, right? Now that, now that maybe the Holy Spirit has spoken to you, and, and, and would you ask Him in this moment, would you give me freedom from these appetites, right? From these affections, from these agendas that are not yours. So would you, would you stand and let's just sing that song to Him. today that freedom is available to you but it takes your step so the prayer team is going to come and I know there's a small amount of space up here but I want you to uh, make your way up here to pray with someone if you need to do that today respond today to God maybe it's just need to find someone to share your struggle with and say I need help to overcome whatever this is but I just want to challenge you today uh, that this is not just a message for you just to hear. This is something for us to move into. So if you need to pray with someone, come pray with someone. Uh, you can put your tithes and offerings, your connect card in the back. Um, but I'm praying that today we're going to see freedom in this house because you took the step forward to do that. Amen? Amen. So let me pray one more time and then I'm going to release you. But if you want to come pray and the band's going to keep singing. Father God, thank you for what you have spoken to us today. Give us courage now to take our steps forward, to follow you in what you have told us today. We pray it all in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. You can have, have a great week. We'll see you guys next week.